We'll get your Bible. I'm going to preach for 18 minutes. Amen. And 18 minutes tonight. 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4. Now you've heard a lot in just a little bit, but I promise you I'm going to try to keep keep my word there. And I know that uh, this time change has some of you, um, like myself, it does mess with you for the first day or so. And uh, today, uh, you know, on Sundays, it, it uh, I don't think folks realize, I, I know you do, but, but Sundays, by that 8.30 service, I'm already geared up. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to preach by 8.30. Uh, but by 12.15, I'm ready to go to bed. Like, I'm tired. And uh, my wife, we were, we were eating lunch today, and, and uh, she said we'd ate uh, you know, lunch, and we were about done. And uh, she said, okay, let's go. And I said, honey, I just want to stay here a minute. Let me just say it. And I did. I sat there for a little while. She was ready to go do something. I said, no, we're not doing anything. We're just going to sit right here. And I want to sit down because I get wore out on Sundays. But it's a good wore out. By Sunday night, I'm ready to hit the bed. And Monday's a good relief that you gave it everything you had. And so I'm, I'm appreciating you. Some of you give it the extra mile on Sundays, and I appreciate that. First John chapter 4 uh, verses 7 through 8. I want to just give you some thoughts tonight. We've been in First John now on Sunday nights for quite some time, other than a few Sunday nights that I feel that God may have another message. But we've been preaching verse by verse through these books of the Bible. And I've been in First John now for quite some time. The Bible says, and it's a very familiar portion of Scripture, if you've been saved any amount of time, you've maybe heard somebody quote this, but the Bible says in First John 4, verse 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the time we have in church tonight. I pray You'll bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we've been talking, I believe First John has a lot to do with the subject of love, loving each other, loving Christ, loving your enemies. And it's expected that the brethren love each other and we have a genuine love of others in our hearts because we're saved. I want you to notice some things about this expectation of loving the saints. Loving the saints. That's us here tonight. If you're saved tonight, uh, you should love each other. Is that not correct? You ought to love each other. So I want you to notice the priority of love. Notice what the Bible says in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. So the Christian's love, love for each other, flows from who? God. It does not come from us. Our hearts is wicked, and or deceitful and above all desperately wicked. So how in the world can our love come from our heart that's wicked and deceitfully messed up and a lying heart and a, and a deceitful heart and a wicked heart? So we can't genuinely love someone without knowing God. So when we love each other, we're expressing our love that comes from the Savior. The Bible says in Romans 5, 5, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Hey, listen, if we're going to love each other as a church that should love each other. See, here's what's bad tonight is a lot of churches that you go in tonight, their love is not there. It does not exist. Matter of fact, there's, there's some malice towards one another and some bickering and fighting and infighting and jealousy and folks that should not exist in the church you keep that stuff out of the church hey we shouldn't have that where's that come from that comes from the devil we expect lost people to act lost but a christian should not act that way amen and uh, we ought to love each other so true love originates in god for love is of god it is god so god is love amen God is love. We love each other. That's why we can come around the altar tonight and pray for the First Baptist Church there in Sutherland Springs that we've never met, probably never will meet this side of heaven. But one day we'll get to meet some of those people and we can pray for them. Why? Because we love the brethren. We love the brethren. We love each other. Uh, I like what Oliver B. Green says about this new nature that God's, it's God's nature that it produces love in us. Listen to what he says. 
The person who does not have a heart of love need not pretend that he is a believer. For God is love, and if a man knows God, then God abides in his heart, and the person with God in his heart will love in deed and in truth, not just in word. When God abides in the heart, love automatically issues from the heart. Never has so much meaning, so much truth, been crowded into three short words, God is love. Isn't that wonderful? When we say God is love, we're saying a whole lot. Amen? God is love. Hey, I would love our church to just dwell in unity and love each other. I want people, when they come and visit our congregation, they say, boy, i tell you one thing about that church. They love each other, and they'll love you if you don't watch out. I mean, that crowd is the lovingest crowd I've ever been around in my life. I want visitors to hear that, hey, that's the friendliest church. That's the lovingest church. You better not tell them you've got a need, or they'll try to fill it, because they love people. Hey, you say, where's that come from? It comes from God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So one who claims to be a Christian, but does not manifest God's love in his life, is like a person who claims to have been born of parents, but he does not in any way resemble his parents. You know, I've, I've, I've had preacher friends before and pastors that I've watched who have had children, and those children turn out to be the exact opposite of what their mom and daddy is. Matter, matter of fact, if you got around them, you would not know that those children even belong to that family. That the only thing that attaches them, of course, is their DNA and their last name that they take. And I've, I've known people try to lose their last name and change their names. They're embarrassed of what they become. Can I tell you, listen, the, how sad is that, that that someone might say, yeah, that's my dad, but the only way you know it is if they told you. That should not be said of us in Christ. People should know that, hey, we're a Christian. That we're of God. Why? Because we love people. We love people. So we see the, we see the uh, priority of love. But can I tell you, there's number two, the presentation of love. Notice this in verses 9 and 10. The Bible says in that same chapter, 1 John 4, the presentation of love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we loved, uh, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Notice that word manifested. It means to make visible. So God has showed us what true love looks like and He has made love visible. You say, preacher, how does God make love visible to people? Well, I, I think this is a good verse. It, it says in Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that word commendeth means to show, to prove, to establish, to exhibit. So not only did God love us, but He sent His Son Jesus to die for us. And Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? He died for us. So the God who hates every sin still loves the sinner. That's good news, isn't it? He loves the sinner. He loves you and me. But then John says this in verse number 10, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us, and He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So I want you to notice that God did not just send Christ because of our love for Him, but because of His love for us. We didn't love God but He went ahead and loved us. Why? Because he's, he's a holy God. He's a perfect God. He's a loving God. And though we did not love Him, He loved us. And the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. Now the world didn't love God, but God loved the world. And He loved Him so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That divine love is a sacrificing love. Love. He sacrificed. Hey, you talk about an example of love, look at the Bible. It's Jesus. Jesus loved us. That word propitiation carries the idea of satisfaction. He was the satisfaction for our sins. 
God's just and righteous demand of perfect holiness had to be satisfied. You preacher, what could he satisfy with? A precious lamb, a spotless lamb, a sinless lamb. Jesus Christ, hey, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. What love is that? What manner of love? Amen? So we can love. We have a presentation of love but then we see the practice of love not notice that uh, uh, notice that verse again the Bible says uh, in verse number uh, I believe it's verse number um, uh, nine the Bible says in this was manifest the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him and then it says uh, in verse number uh, here in his love not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of for our sins. Notice that little phrase, but that He loved us and sent His Son. Notice the words, uh, notice the words that, uh, that God said. Notice the word sent. Notice that in verse, number, in verse number 10, that He sent His Son. God practiced what He's preaching. He sent His Son. Uh, he saw a need and it moved Him to do something about it. Amen? He saw a need and He sent Jesus. By the way, God wasn't searching through heaven looking for a Savior. It was Jesus, the only one. Right. Amen. I've heard songs that said He looked through heaven. And my friend, He didn't have to look through heaven. It was Jesus Christ and only Jesus that could save our sins. So we can never love the way that we're supposed to until we fully surrender to Christ and love through us. We see in Luke chapter 9. You say, preacher, where do you get an example of that? Turn over to Luke chapter 9. I just got a few minutes. Luke chapter 9, and uh, I want you to notice something. Luke chapter 9, uh, here we see in our Bibles a little story, verses 51 through 56. I want you to notice what love will do to someone. It's interesting to note the writer of this epistle, 1 John, did not always practice what he's writing down right now. I want you to notice something. There was a little change of heart in John's life. The Bible says in Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, it says, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. Uh, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord... Now notice what they said about these Samaritans that did not receive Christ. Now notice, Lord, wilt thou that would we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? You know what James and John want to do? They want to pray down fire on that crowd. Lord, did you see what they did? They would not receive you. Let's just pray fire on them and watch them burn. Boy, that sounds like a Christian, doesn't it? Let's just do what Elijah did. You know that story, Jesus, that, that story about Elijah when he was praying down fire and it consumed all those false prophets? Yeah, wouldn't you like to see that? James and John, these people right here, they deserve it, don't they? Same John that's writing this, loving each other. Same John. Same John. Same John because he says, Notice, but he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Now Jesus said, hold on a second, where did that come from? Verse 56, For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. End the story. Jesus said, what, are you, what was that? That came from the devil. I did not come down here to rain fire on people. I came down here to save that crowd. Thank God. John, boy, I tell you what. People's like, well, if I was God, I'd take care. If you were God, we'd be in a mess. If I was God, we'd be in a mess. I, that crowd don't like me. That family don't like me. That person don't like me. God, take care of them now. I mean, just just take care of them and drop down a bomb on them or something. Hey, you know what? That ain't of God. Oh, people that don't like you and we just all of a sudden start thinking ill of them. That's not love. So John had a change. John asked. He said, hey, will you command fire down on these people that don't like And the Lord rebuked him. Hey, what a difference between John in the Gospel of Luke uh, and, and, and uh, now and then here in 1 John. Uh, what a difference it was. The author there, John had to learn to love by surrendering to obey Christ. He had to learn what love is. 
Before his conversion, Paul went out in Acts chapter 9. We don't have time to turn there, but y'all remember the conversion of Paul. His name was Saul. And he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Paul literally went around railing on, and the Bible says, making havoc of the church. I mean, he would bust up tonight, and he would just start doing what that man did down in Texas, start persecuting the church and beating the church and pulling people up and doing things to them and trying to uh, wreck the service and imprison people and uh, uh, falsely accuse people and doing all that. That's what, that's what he did. But after his conversion, Paul writes a chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, on charity. You say, preacher, what happened between Acts chapter 9 and 1 Corinthians chapter 13? There was something that took place in here. The same man that was beating people for going to church and railing on them is the same man that wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The greatest passage on the Christian's love life. You say, preacher, what happened? You ask, how is that? The, simple, the, the answer is simple. The love of God was shed abroad in his heart. No longer was he dependent on human affection with its boundaries and limits. He now was a partaker of divine love. You say, preacher, how can I love greater? Love God greater. Be filled with the Spirit of God. As we preached last Sunday night, mortify this flesh. Amen. How can I love greater? How can I have a greater love for my co-workers? Love in the Spirit. See, Christ's love has no measure or limits to the surrendered Christian. So how can we be fully surrendered? How can we love love without boundaries? Hey, love without prejudice. Amen? Love people, not for what they look like, not for what they can do for you, but preacher, how can I love? Hey, surrender fully to God. Have a compassion. When you're looking for people and you're looking... The Bible says that in the book of Matthew about Jesus that when He looked and surveyed the crowd, He looked on the multitude, His heart was moved with compassion. Is that Could that be said of us? I mean, think about it. When we look at some of these folks that come to our doorsteps or we go out to their community, me and Jesse was knocking on doors yesterday and talked to a young man that had lost everything. My heart was moved. And he even told, he said, Preacher, I've made the wrong decisions and I've messed my life up. Hey, I left there thinking, Dear God, what can we do for this community? Hey, we can love them. We can love them. We can love them. So we see there is a, uh, there is a uh, expectation of loving the saints. But lastly, there's an example. It's a loving Savior. The Bible says in verse 11, Look, and I'm done. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. I mean, that's a command. Beloved, if God loves us, I've got to love you. If I don't love you, I'm in direct disobedience to God and His Word. Now, I can love you and not necessarily have to like you. You say, how is that possible? It is possible. I mean, there is some folks that I enjoy being around because they lift your spirit and they, 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 they're encouraging. Then there's others you're like, oh, boy, if I ever get around that person again, man, I'm going to have to good night, take some Benadryl or something. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, that, and you know, you, you just, there's some folks that you may love to be around. It's easy to love them, but there's others that may make it difficult. But you guess what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to love them. And whoever God sends to our church, we ought to love them. Love them to death. I mean, just love the fire out of them. I mean, love them. You know what makes your enemy probably hate you more? Loving them. You know what makes people so irritated at you? Loving them. And just when your enemy tries to get at you and dig at you and persecute you, hey, love them to death. Because when you stoop down to their level and you start firing back at them and being ugly, you just went down to their level and you've... you've listen, you're in de- direct disobedience to God and His Word. So there's the proof of love. The proof of love is God's love lies in the fact that He, John 3.16, gave His only begotten Son. 
So notice it does not say uh, in, in Romans 5, 8, but God committed His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice it does not say while we were good, Christ died for us. It does not say while we were trying our best, Christ, Christ died for us. It does not say because we were worth so much, Christ died for us. No, a thousand times it does not say that. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this is the proof that God loves us. He loves the lost and He loves judgment, deserving, hell-bound sinners. He loves us tonight. Hey, He loves us on our good days, but He also loves us on our bad days. And I thank the Lord for that. There's the proof of love. There's the practice of love. He said we ought to also love each other. So as God's children, we have His nature, and therefore we love one another. That word ought, if you look at that, verse 11, that word ought means to owe money or to be in debt. How many of you know what ought means? Ought. To owe money or to be in debt. So Noah Webster gives the following definition as to be indebted, to be obliged or bound to pay. So, because God's love, we are uh, indeed debted and bound to pay by loving one another. Isn't that something? I'm indebted to love you. you uh, J.W. Uh, J. Canoy said, God's wonderful love does not end with Calvary. It flourishes and is perfected within us. Boy, think about that. Then there's the picture of love. The Bible says, look at verse 12, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. So here's the deal. The closest thing to God's love that an unsaved person can see is the love we have toward one another. That lost man may never come to Bible Baptist Church, but he can see God's love in your life. If you come to church or come to work on Monday morning and you start complaining and backbiting and gossiping about somebody, say, so, yeah, I'll tell you one thing down in our church, i tell you, we got some guy down there going down. I, and you just start criticizing, you start complaining, you start tearing people down, you start talking about them. That lost man's going to look and say, man, there's no changed life in that man. He doesn't love anybody. He's just like me. But when you truly love somebody and that love is shed abroad in your heart, God is made manifest. His love is made manifest in your life. We ought to love people. We ought to forgive people. If somebody's wronged you, you know what love will do? Love forgives. Well, I'll never forget what you did. You ain't forgiven. I'll forgive you, but I ain't forgetting. What kind of comment is that? There's sometimes we can't forget. There's sometimes I'd like to forget, but you can't. But hold on. When you forgive somebody, you're laying it aside and saying, you know what? It's out. I don't care about it anymore. I've got the love of Christ in my heart and I forgive you. Forgive. We, need a, we need a revival of forgiveness in our churches, don't we? In our marriages. In our marriages. Somebody does something. and Where's the love of Christ in our marriages? Yeah. Where's the love of Christ in our relationships? How about, how about uh, folks, uh, Brother Jacob, you can come to the piano. How about in our children, raising our children? Do, let me ask you, Mom and Dad, real quick. Does your children see the love of Christ in how you treat each other? The reason, and could be the reason, that a lot of our children, when they get 18 years of age and they leave the church and they go out and experience things, is because they never really seen the real deal in the home. You talk a big talk, but you're not walking. I'll tell you the greatest tragedy that you can do to your child, I believe, is the fact that when you get in your car on Sunday morning or Sunday night or whenever your church is and you start talking and tearing down people, and them little ears in the back seat here, they're not hearing love talk. They're not hearing, boy, boy, I love so and so. Isn't that, isn't that, they're the most precious people. I mean, that church, boy, I tell you, thank God you sent us that church. And they're not hearing that kind of talk because, you know, I mean, that kind of talk, that's contagious. People, wow, what happened to my mom and dad? 
hold on a second. Which, which parents are they seeing? Are they seeing those that get in the car and say, i tell you one thing. If I see so-and-so again, I'm, I just can't handle it anymore. I don't like that guy. I don't like the way he looks at me. I don't like him. i tell you, bless God, next time I see him, I'm going to tell him what I think. And that preacher, if he preaches over 8 o'clock anymore, I'm just, or 7 o'clock rather, I'm just going, i tell you what I'll do. I'll just get my stuff and walk out. I just don't agree with everything going on down there. Blah, blah. You know what? And, you're, and them kids are back there saying, boy, that's weird because inside the church, mom and dad act like everything's good. But when they get in the car, they're just... Hey, that's not the love of Christ. No. We're supposed to be helping one another and loving one another. and Even in our down times, forgiving one another. Hey, husbands and wives, hey, let's be patient with one another. Compassionate. So if somebody's going to mess up, somebody's going to drop the ball, somebody's going to forget something, instead of ripping their head off, we can say, you know what? The only way I can know how to love somebody is love the way that God loves me. And He loves me. He loves me when I'm down. He loves me when I mess up. I should be the same way with somebody else. Especially that wife of yours or that husband of yours. Those children. Friend, I think we need a revival of a reminder of what love is. We have an example, right? We have an example. We ought to love these missionaries when they come through. Send them, listen, send them on their way. And they say one thing about when they go to the next church. I can tell you this, I, I have not spoken to them. But I can tell you this, every church they go to, it ain't always about love. Mm -mm. Sometimes these missionaries get in a place where they don't feel welcome. I've been there before. I've preached a few meetings before I didn't feel welcome. I'm thinking, what in the world y'all call me here for? I should have stayed at the house. Not that y'all should roll out the red carpet. My goodness, man, we ought to ice, ice skate it in here. Amen? Hey, we ought to be a church that loves, and you can feel that warm love in the church because God loves us. Amen?